Hello, BookTube, and hello, AuthorTube. I don't, I don't say hello to AuthorTube enough, do I? And I should, because I love AuthorTube. I don't watch enough AuthorTube, in fact. Uh, the AuthorTube community on BookTube started out as a splinter group of our bookish community and has now grown enormously. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of channels. And every time I find a new one, I like it. So I, I ought to make a, a point of going out looking for AuthorTube videos, and I ought to make more author AuthorTube videos videos myself because I am an author. <laughs> not only not only do I write fiction at every opportunity that I can because it's such an incredible feeling. Those of you who haven't tried it, it is such an incredible exhilaration to be crafting your own fiction. It's just amazing. Words don't do it justice until you've tried it. Uh, but it's not only that. Like, for instance, I always do NaNoWriMo every year. I'll be doing it this year. I'm doing Camp NaNoWriMo this year. I work in Lethals, my very first police procedural. Uh, but it's also that, you know, leaving out the fiction, <laughs> I also write for a living, <laughs> which not a lot of people on AuthorTube can say. Uh, I write book reviews. Several a day. <laughs> and at least one or two a day are for fairly large audiences for money. Uh, so that counts. <laughs> it's not just me. It's not just me, uh, you know, spouting my two cents worth wherever. Uh, so I feel like a part of AuthorTube, although maybe they wouldn't have me. Maybe they would hate me because maybe they would think I smell. Uh, but one way or another, I found an AuthorTube tag that I wanted to do. A tag for Tag uh, Thursday. So, and this is the Writers Are Weird tag, <laughs> which I just love. And I think I'm late to the party getting to it. It was created by Elliot Brook. I'll leave a link to her channel down below. And I saw it in two different places. On Kent Sean's channel, an author tube, an author tuber that I, uh, of the type that I didn't know about, watched his channel and liked what I saw. And also uh, Colin Clark also did a version of the Writers Are Weird tag. I'll leave a link to both their channels down below because they're well worth your time uh, to watch. And it's, this is all about uh, weird writers, the weirdness that attends with the process of writing. Uh, and question number one is, do you have bizarre internet searches? If so, what's the weirdest one? And this refers to the fact that writers do their research online. Uh, once upon a time, you were all absolutely free from internet searches, but uh, from that coming back to haunt you. But now, someone is watching what you do. So Google is watching what you do when you search for things online, and your search your search patterns can be called up. And uh, that's true for me as well. And in my case, it's a rather exaggerated example because for NaNoWriMo a couple of years ago, I did a story called Markowitz and the Mystery Woman. It was about a young man named Markowitz who was a conspiracy theorist. He was uh, obsessed with conspiracy theories. And when I was uh, hashing out that novel, preparatory to starting by 1,667 words a day, I thought, well, okay, I, I, I just reflexively thought, oh, I'll have Markowitz be obsessed with 9-11 truthers with what really happened on, 9, on the 9-11 terrorist attacks on American soil. That he'll, that's what the, the conspiracy theory that he'll be obsessed with. Those are the conventions that he'll go to. Those are the lunatics that he will talk with. That's the world, the rabbit hole, that he will be well down in when we meet him. But the more I thought about that, the more I thought, well, no, no, what, are you, what you really want to do here is invent a catastrophe. Invent something similar to 9-11, or maybe worse than 9-11, and then invest it with as many rabbit hole details as you can imagine. As many as you have with 9-11, where there have been long monographs written on the mornings of one of the people at Morgan Stanley who was killed when the first plane hit the first tower. With all sorts of, of uh, you know, whiteboard lines drawn between that person's morning and a bunch of other stuff. That kind of detail. I wanted that kind of detail. And uh, I decided that the, the disaster that I was going to invent was going to be a third-party radical actor shipping a remote-controlled, dirty nuclear bomb in a shipping container to Pittsburgh, to a harbor in Pennsylvania, and then having it go off. And it in order to flesh out that disaster, in order to know what, what Markowitz knew, I wanted to know everything that Markowitz knows and everything that all the other conspiracy theorists know about this event. All the potential suspects, the official story, the raw mechanics of it, 
And that meant that I had to do a lot of Google searching that has probably put me on a number of government watch lists <laughs> because I had to reconstruct. I had to construct in, in research how you would go about doing that, where you would get the material. Because, and the reason I had to do this is because I knew that the conspiracy theorists would chase down all these things. So I had to know them too. So where would you get your dirty bomb? How would you find it? How would you manufacture it yourself? Would you buy it from a third party? And if so, who would they be? And where did they get the material? Where would all of it originally come from? When was it put on the shipping container? And who owns the shipping container? And who owns the consortium that owns that consortium? And how long has it been in a Pennsylvania harbor? And also tons of research on what such an explosion would do in a heavily urban area. How far the damage would extend. How many people you could expect to die. And also, <laughs> talk about watch lists. I also had to research the forensics of such an event it would be theoretical because nothing like that thank god has ever happened but i had to research theoretical forensics to figure out after the fact how much would you realistically be able to piece together about the people who did it how much would you realistically be able to know about them how much did the government know were there any electronic communications that were intercepted and ignored things like that and again i had to know that because in this story there was going to be an official story just like on 9-11 there was going to be eventually a blue ribbon government panel was going to examine this catastrophe and come out with its own version of the 9-11 report of of the Mueller report of of uh, the Warren Commission there was going to be a, a, a sanctioned government version of what happened I had to know what that was and I had to know what all the conspiracy theory uh, enthusiasts would pick at it how they would pick at it uh, so I had to research that whole thing and I had to do it down to the last detail so that it would be believable there are huge chunks of Margaret's and the mystery woman that are just Marky what's talking over that catastrophe with other ardent enthusiasts who either think it never happened or think it happened in a completely different way than the government says it happened I had to know every detail of it backwards and forwards and to Google <laughs> to its to its algorithms to perhaps any government agencies that might have been watching it had to look like I was planning such a thing like I was researching that stuff in order to do it that's the risk that authors run now when their search because their searches are known outside of libraries or their or their own home or their own imagination now it used to be that once upon a time if in the 1940s or 50s you wanted to write oh I don't know a murder mystery about a copycat serial killer who's intentionally imitating Jack the Ripper's crimes. Well, then you had to know everything there was to know about Jack the Ripper's crimes, and then you had to pick an area in the United States where you could get away with something like that, where there wasn't a whole lot of police presence, or where there were lots of prostitutes, or where there was lots of, of crime anyway. And in the 1940s, all of that research, you would have done demographics on... on inner city blighted inner cities you would have done demographics on unsolved murder cases you would have done an extensive amount of research on Jack the Ripper's killings but no one would have known that at all even librarians at your library wouldn't have been paying that much of attention and librarians are very very touchy about revealing that kind of stuff it's a it's a, san a sanction a, a sacred duty of theirs they they don't rat on their patrons or at least I, the good ones don't uh, so you could in the 1940s or 50s you could have done all of that without raising any suspicions about yourself not so now <laughs> not so now at all I don't know how some thriller writers do it I really don't if, if we have you have thriller writers today who are writing about child prostitute rings how do they research that without having the FBI at their door every day. How do they do that? I don't know. I don't know. But in terms of question number one, I do have, I, occasionally I have dodgy internet searches. That is probably the pinnacle. That is probably the worst that we'll ever get. And who knows how many people know that. <laughs> so question number two is, do you write people you know and dislike into your story as villains or dumb people, specifically in order to kill them off? <laughs> uh, and I think here about a, a quote from Trollope. Not Anthony Trollope, Francis Trollope, Fanny Trollope, his universally famed and beloved author mother, who wrote that she uses her friends in, in friends and acquaintances in stories, but you'd never know it. She makes sure to pulp them first. She said you'd never recognize a pig in a sausage. And that's the rule I try to follow. Salient characteristics here and there, a particular hand gesture, a particular affectation of voice or whatever, that can help a lot. Especially if it's a minor character, that's maybe all you need. 
for a minor character is that. And why bother to go to the, the bother of thinking that up when you have something that you want to capture in words anyway. Uh, but wholesale reproduction, I've almost never done that. There's one character in one novel that I wrote, my novel Optimus, about the Roman Emperor Trajan. There's one character in that book that's based on a real person and that's virtually a mimeograph of that person, only with togas instead of designer clothes. But other than that, I, I did that and I, I have to confess, it wasn't satisfying. It wasn't satisfying in the way that I thought it would be at all. It, it, when you are involved in writing fiction, when you're involved in writing a long work of fiction, there is a, a high that goes with that. There's an exhilaration that's almost of godlike power. And you would think that if that's true, moving people you hate around as little puppets and throwing them under the wheels of taxis or having them decapitated would be a godlike thing and would be very enjoyable, but it feels very soiling. At least it did for me. That was the one and only time that I did it, and after that, after that, no. <laughs> no, it, it felt cheap. So now I mix and match things. The only exception that I will ever make in that regard is if someone actually asks me to be a character, a minor character in a book. If somebody does that and, and says, you know, try not to, to vilify me, then I will do that. But otherwise, actually, it's not just me. I think it's kind of a cheap thing. It happens all the time. It, it's, it's littered all throughout works that are canonical now in Western literature. But if I don't know, I still think there's something about the portrait that I'm reading that feels a little bit extra animated in an, in an oily kind of way. And then invariably when I find out what that portrait is and that it's, uh, it was meant as petty vengeance on the part of the author, invariably it lowers my estimation of the whole work. So I, I try not to do it anymore. It's also a little more interesting to invent from whole cloth. Uh, question number three, does personal hygiene sometimes come second to writing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> this touches on a lot of Steve hobby horses about writing. If I were going to make regular writing videos, that's what they would be. It would just be a stable of hobby horses. And one of my main uh, hobby horses is that people who call themselves writers who don't take writing seriously. And, and I think I understand that. I think part of that is a defense mechanism in case the writing goes poorly or you're not good at it. But it's still inexcusable. You're supposed to, you're, it's something that you're doing, it's, you're supposed to take it seriously. It's going to have your name on it. Uh, and this touches on that because the picture that's raised here is that sometimes you're just on a, on a jag for writing. You're just going, it's going so well or you can't wait to get to it so much that you postpone the shower or you postpone doing your hair or whatever. Uh, because, you know, you're in the moment and that bugs me because that's not taking writing seriously. That's, that's waiting around for the writing fairy to drop inspiration in your cradle. That's not the way it should be done. And if you're going to take it seriously, that means that you should prepare for it. I have old school writer friends who have writing rooms in their houses. They're published authors. They have writing rooms in their authors and they have regular hours in those rooms. And they make a point of saying, of stressing, my friends and family know that I'm going to work. doesn't matter that it's in the attic. I'm going to work. And I dress. I don't wear it sweatpants, I don't have bare feet, I dress for work. I go and I commit to that time. Uh, and imagine what one of those people would say if you said, well, do you ever let personal hygiene get in the way? No. If you're letting personal hygiene get in the way, then you are just going with the flow. And that is a way of acknowledging that your writing is not entirely under your control. And that's bad. That's a recipe for failure. Uh, so no, I don't. I feel very refreshed after a shower. Usually what I will do is do the whole morning. So I will, I will peck away at the overnight emails and I will give Frida a couple of walks, a very short one because she doesn't like mornings, and then a slightly longer one a little later on to stretch our legs. And I'll you know, fix some breakfast and check the you know, neaten, neaten the work area and whatnot that I've left a mess from the night before. But then when it comes time to work, then I take a nice refreshing shower and dress for work and sit down and work. So no, I don't, I very intentionally don't let things like personal hygiene get in the way of writing and I don't think you should either. Uh, let's see here, question number four, do you go on baby name websites to help you name your characters? I'm blessed here, I've heard this from so many authors that say, that tell me that the hardest part of what they do is coming up with names. And I can certainly see that that'd be true with a lot of contemporary fiction where the, the characters have names that no human being has ever had. That, names that are so ridiculous fawn or bright light of morning or thunderbolt kid collins 
that you, it takes you right out of the story. And you're thinking, Fred isn't good? Your main character's named Thunderbolt Kid Collins. And, and you, that's not a nickname. That's actually what his parents christened him at the baptismal font. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I guess that's a reflection of the way, the fact that some writers find it hard to come up with names. I'm blessed. That has never been a problem for me. Of course, it's helped in that a lot of the writing that I have done has been historical fiction, where the names are provided for me. But even when I'm writing contemporary stuff, the last few things that I've done have been contemporary stories. It's not a problem for me. So no, I don't ever consult lists of any kind. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Question number five, do you have a list of actors or actresses who would play your characters if there was an adaptation made? No. No, I don't. I, I don't do it after the fact, mainly because I forget I move on to something else, but I certainly don't do it during the act of writing, because if you start to do that, you're going to start to write that actor. And then, again, you are leaning on something outside of your own creativity to get the job done. No, 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 I don't want to do that. Not at all. I don't, I, I don't think, in retrospect, I've hardly ever, even retroactively, cast any of the stuff that I've written. I don't, I don't think that way because I think that gets in the way of your creative process. Uh, question number six, have you ever stared at a stranger because they look like one of your characters? <laughs> no, no, I've never done that. I have, I have stared at strangers because they look exactly like someone I knew who's dead. And that is unclassifiable as an emotion. I don't know, I never know what to do with those moments. Thankfully, it doesn't happen that often. But when it does, it floors me. And it very nearly supersedes my self-control. So I will be walking down the street, or I'll be on the subway, or I'll be in a crowd of some kind, back when we had crowds. And I will see, I'll just, out of the, out of the corner of my eye, I'll catch a glimpse of someone. And think, the, the, my very first reaction is, oh, I have missed talking to you so much. We have so much to catch up on. And then a fraction of a second later, I realize, no. I've missed talking to you because you're gone. You're, you're not alive anymore. That's why we don't talk anymore. And then I will give, uh, instead of the corner of my eye, I will turn my whole attention. And every once in a while, sometimes it's just a random fleet, you know, freak of the imagination, but every once in a while, it will be because that stranger in the crowd is actually a dead ringer for the person I knew. And I confess, as weird as it must be, I, I don't think I've ever been caught doing it, but as weird as it must be for that other person, I confess, when that happens, it hardly ever happens, I'd say once every five years or so, I stare. And it's not because I can't believe what I'm seeing. It's not because of I, any kind of silly belief in reincarnation or anything like that. It's because I miss that face and I want to drink in the details before this person wanders off into the crowd. That's all. I'm drinking it in just to reinforce memories. I'm not fooling myself. I know there's no connection. I know there's no hidden descendant or anything like that. It's just I've had a vivid reminder and I want that, especially when the person involved, the dead person involved, is not recorded in any way. Maybe a couple of black and white photographs, but no living memory, where there's no, there's no video, there's no movies. There are quite a few people in, I've loved in, that I have in my memory without that. And the motion of them in the bright light of day fades a little in your memory, much as you might try to hold on to it, it fades a little. So on those rare occasions when I've seen someone that's like that, I've just I've just absorbed the experience until I don't have access. I don't follow them or anything, but I've, I've absorbed the access while I have it. To just, yeah, that's, that's what you looked like when you were smiling on a curb on a cloudy afternoon. That's what you looked like. I just absorbed that, but not my characters. I don't have a firm enough look of what my characters look like to ever do that. Uh, let's see here. Question number seven. Do you talk to yourself to help you wor yourself work through scenes? And if so, where do you talk to yourself? I don't talk to myself to work through scenes, but I do read dialogue aloud, especially if it's a patch of dialogue. I'll read it aloud to make sure that it flows. You really can't do as good a job ascertaining that if you're only reading it on the page. It really helps to read it out loud. And uh, recently, in, in when I've been writing contemporary stuff, and especially for this police procedural, I work in lethals, I'm trying an experiment here of trying to make the dialogue do a lot of work. So not, you know, a bit of dialogue and then he said looking at such and such a thing and trying to think of such and such a thing. No larding of the dialogue. I'm trying to just have the dialogue stand and even sometimes go stretches without identifying the speaker. And one of the main ways to do that, aside from sheer momentum, but one of the main ways to do that is to make sure that the speakers sound different from each other. 
And one of the surest ways to know whether or not that's true is to read it out loud. I don't know how anybody could do that otherwise than reading out loud. So I don't, I don't read in order to, uh, uh, in, in order to work through a scene because I know what the scene is going to be already. But I read the dialogue out loud anyway, just to see how it works, to see how it sounds. Uh, and question number eight is somewhat similar. It's while writing, do you make the expressions your characters are making? I don't ever do that. No, I, maybe that means that I'm a hack. <laughs> I don't ever do that. Sometimes when I'm sketching, I think that's universal among people who sketch. If I'm sketching an angry face, I will often, just by reflex, reflect that. Uh, but not, not writing, no. Uh, question number nine, do you ever practice answering interview questions in case you make it big? <laughs> I'm never going to make it big. No. And also I don't need it. I don't need to practice answering interview questions. Thanks very much. I'm what's colloquially known as a gas bag. <laughs> so I will talk for an hour and a half on any subject at any time whether I've made it big or not. <laughs> so, uh, and question number 10. Uh, do you have a soundtrack and or playlist for your book or scenes from your book? No, I do not. And this is a familiar hobby horse. This would be in Steve's stable of hobby horses. I also resist the idea of soundtracks for books or scenes because when you have a perfect soundtrack, something that puts you exactly in the mind frame of what you're trying to write, you are resting a burden of what you're doing on something outside of yourself. You didn't make that music and you're not playing it. It's not like you're remembering it. I've known writers who needed their soundtrack in order to get in the mood to write anything. And if they didn't have the soundtrack, they didn't do any writing. Now, this is probably not an extreme example like that, but any temptation in that direction is bad. You should, pra at least first, for a year, you should make sure that your writing is entirely under your control. Once you're entirely sure of that, by adding nothing to it, no snacks, no magic pen, no magic paper, no nothing, just generate the words, no matter what, no matter what, just generate the words, just generate material. Once you've done that for a year and you know that you can do that under any circumstances whatsoever, once your discipline is rock solid, then I guess you could make a playlist. But even then, sooner or later, probably sooner rather than later, the playlist will be helping you to get through the writing, and that is wrong. The only thing that should get you through the writing is you. The minute you start placing burdens on other things, whether it's a quote-unquote inspiration, or the right place, or the right time of day, or standing against a refrigerator, or whatever it is, whatever the, the, the tick is, the minute you start placing those things, giving them uh, agency, as the 21st century says, you are removing that from yourself. So I, soundtracks make me touchy. <laughs> but that's it. That is the uh, writers are weird tag. There's just 10 questions. And all I have to do is tag people, and I naturally want to tag all the writers out there. I had uh, three names came to mind. James Holder. I'd love to hear your questions of this. Uh, Rachel Morrow, who's writes all the time, and also Elizabeth Tyree. But also three other names came to mind of channels that seem defunct. We seem to lose author tubes, author tube, uh, book tubers. Like Samuel Darham. It's been months since Samuel Darham made, made a video. Is he still around? Is he still writing? What about Ben Sanders? Actually written a novel. Was, does, has done lots and lots of great writing content. Great writing videos, but no video in a month. Also, uh, pints and paperbacks? No video in a month. Has books has written, has done videos about writing. So of course I would tag them a little forlornly. I don't know if they're still alive. <laughs> but but anybody, anybody that's watching this video that does some writing, I would love to hear your answers to these questions because these are a hoot. <laughs> so that's a tag Thursday for you. I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.